All right, everybody. Time to rock and roll. Uh, my name is Aaron Elder. I'm the head of the Throws Room, so if you need anything from uh, uh, me or have suggestions or, or anything, uh, let me know at any time. I'll be here all weekend. Um, we've got some fantastic speakers this year, so I'm really excited for this. Um, our first one up here is T.J. Crater. Um, T.J. is the other director at Ironwood, Pro Center after 19 years of college coaching. Um, formerly the Pro coach at University of Arizona. Uh, 2021, T.J. coaches athletes to several accomplishments, including four school records, three first-team All-American honorees, three Olympic trials qualifiers, and two conference champions. I'm sure I'm leaving out. Oh, what's Alan actually? He's going, I like this. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> that also. Uh, TJ himself was a, was a four year letter winner at the University of Idaho from 1998 to 2002. He's taking yourself a little bit of their coach. Yeah, he's in the years. Yeah, okay. so you, you wrote the Bible, dude. Uh, <laughs> I did. Cut the pace. Cut the pace. <laughs> uh, TJ earned all Big West Conference uh, for four or five times, three times in the hammer, and uh, twice in the shot put. So, ladies and gentlemen, TJ Gray. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, yeah, so it's kind of just getting into the calmer world of not being in college athletics anymore, but still wanting very much to be a part of the throws and had a great opportunity to kind of start the transition in Ironwood. So uh, thank you very much, Aaron, for inviting me to be here. But uh, so. Just a really simple presentation, just some, some things that I've used, some things I've stolen from other people on just being able to establish really basic principles in the discus. So nothing too crazy, just simple ideas that I use for athletes and, and how that varies off of that is kind of the style thing with how that athlete is built, how they move, how they perceive what we're trying to do. Um, I talked a little bit about this last night with the other coaches, but I, instead of using some of my collegiate athletes or some of the professional athletes I've been able to coach that can, you know, show you the drills perfectly and this is how they're supposed to look, I utilize a lot of our athletes at the Thrower Center just so it's a little bit more realistic as they're doing these drills, some common corrections to what you might see on the video. Um, but as I go through this, if you have any questions, please ask. Um, as I think everyone will say from a presentation standpoint today, this is what I've used. It's not everything that I use, um, but there's a lot of different ways to solve these problems, but these are the ones that I've had a lot of success with and gotten a lot of positive feedback from the athletes on them. So, um, I, I, I've learned that just trying to keep it simple. If you're, if you're trying to operate under looking through a lens of, if you've got two feet on the ground, I always want to make sure the athletes are on balance. That doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be 50-50 over their feet, but are they balanced? Are, are they in a position to, to put force into the ground? Are they in a position to be able to accelerate their hips into the throw? Their posture, are, you know, is there an axis lined up? Can they turn, can they move through the throw without falling with their upper body? Along with that, the shoulder alignment, especially with the discus and trying to create separation or tension as soon as possible in the throw. A lot of athletes are gonna to try to go as fast as they possibly can out of the back and then try to regain the separation in the front of the circle. They're gonna to try to correct the problems by trying to throw themselves back away from the throw when they get to the stand. So everything I wanna do, I want to generate as much separation between the hips and the shoulders in the back of the circle and be able to accelerate through that, not have to pause and stop or try to rewrap their upper body into the throw. Um, and try to create tension across the shoulders, between the hips and shoulders, between the, the chest and the arm, trying to find as much possible tension through the throw as we can. So for today, I'll kind of break it down into three portions of the throw, the entry or the back of the circle, the transition basically anything from the back of the circle into the stand, and then the stand throw. And again, these are really simple concepts that I think, especially at a high school level, it gives a lot of feedback to the athletes where they can feel it instead of just looking at you and nodding when you ask them, did you feel that? Oh, I think so. 
it gives them the feedback. They're in control when they're in the circle. So as you're giving them a cue, they know what they're trying to feel. They're not just trying to do what you say. They know what they're trying to set out to do. So in the back of the circle, uh, these are the three that I like to use. Um, the 360, I don't try to rely on too much. I think it's a good concept to get them to understand you know, a wide sweep and holding their posture, but especially with a lot of younger athletes, they might not have the lower body strength to be able to come all the way around it, so they're gonna wanna obviously use their upper body, but it's a good general concept. A step to 90, which, you know, it's, you're basically just gonna step out to that South African position, but understanding how to get over their left and how to use their right leg. And then just, as simple as it sounds, just teaching them how to wind properly. How to set up that tension and still stay over if they're a right-handed thrower, stay over that left leg and, and put themselves into a good position. Okay, so super again, I'm gonna kick a dead horse here. These are just really basic drills, but it gives the athletes a lot of feedback. They're see, feeling the difference. They're not just nodding when you say good job or you need to do a better job. You can just go hit the air a little bit. So just, that's a 10 pound bar she's got on her back. You can do it with a PVC pipe. If you've got a, an older athlete that's got the strength, I, the 45 pound bar, I, you can do it from a strength standpoint or if they're having a lot of trouble feeling the ground, but I'd like to keep it a little bit lighter so they can feel that stretch in their shoulders. But the, the goal of this is to keep their feet plugged into the ground. I don't want them wandering back and forth here. I want to create tension in the hips and between the shoulders. So I want them to feel their posture and how much pressure they're putting into the ground as their shoulders are winding. So you just want to give them something that's going to have a little bit of feedback. She's staring at the ground, I'm, but keeping the head up and just being aware of what their shoulders are doing. Go ahead and click on the ugly guy. So it's just an 800 gram ball. So. Same idea, a little bit of weight over my left leg, more than my, my right leg is, is firm, but winding the shoulders back, pulling the discus back with the shoulder blade, not just holding the discus up with their shoulders and winding, setting, pulling back with the, the shoulder blade and turning the shoulders, winding around their spine, not shifting their weight over to the right. Just trying to set up that drive position as much as possible. You click on that one more time, I'm the ugly guy. Just getting them comfortable with that. Not sitting in the back of the circle for 25 minutes, you know, like they're winding up a toy, but just being comfortable with setting this position, feeling that stretch with the shoulder blade pulled back, and also feeling that they're setting up that tension between their hips and their shoulders. Just trying to, again, give them that feedback. Go ahead. So, this is the big thing that is, also, I like it in the javelin as well, but not trying to hold the discus here, trying to hold the discus with the shoulder blade. What that does is they'll be able to lock it back, feel that stretch across the chest, but they're not having to worry about where the discus is at through the throw. It's locked back into position, it's up behind the shoulder. They're not trying to move the discus throughout the throw. They can just worry about the level of their shoulders and, and attacking with the uh, lower body. Keeping the head still, oh, sorry, keeping the head still, Again, winding the shoulders away from the hips, trying not to turn the hips with the shoulders. We want to create that tension as they come back so we've already got the hip ahead of the shoulder. We're not having to slow down the upper body as we go into the throw. Ground contact. Sarah, my, my, my lovely assistant here, uh, will probably talk about this, but she uses the analogy of your feet are like plugging into a, a socket in the wall. So I use that analogy quite a bit, is plugging your feet into the ground. If you're not feeling ground contact on both legs, you're not in a powerful position to be able to, to apply speed or force into the throw. And with the weight distribution, I always have the athletes start 50-50. And as they wind, I just want the right leg at a firm bend so they're not shifting their weight over their right side. We want to keep weight over the left. Keep the right foot flat. This is just a, a style thing for me. So as they wind, they still have their weight over, their left foot can turn, but they still have weight over it. So try to keep that right foot flat, a firm bend in the right side, so your weight is still over your left. Okay. 
360 drill. On this demonstration, he's got a, a wooden dowel over his shoulder just because we're working on, he has a tendency to want to dive into the circle, so I wanted to reinforce that. But again, balance over your feet with a firm right leg flat on the ground, so you're almost feeling a push with that right side. So you're creating a stretch across the hips. We're not just picking up our left or right foot and kicking it up. You're actually using that right side to get over your left and get some momentum around. Winding the shoulders back to feel just a little bit of tension as you're coming around. Again, push with the right leg. And then that left, the cue I like to use is not trying to sit with the hip, is to push their left knee out over the ball of the foot. Think about loading a spring down early, not trying to load to the circle, push out over the toes here so you're gonna set a wider path around your left side and it's gonna do a better job of keeping the weight over the ball of the foot and slow the left side down so they're not rushing in that left foot, it's just not freely spinning. They're actually gonna be able to feel getting out around their left side. And with him especially, I just tell him low, level, and wide. So we want the right leg low, I want his shoulders level, and I want a big wide sweep coming around the corner. It's gonna feel slow. And I'd rather have an athlete maintain the posture and stay wide, not get the whole way around, then try to tuck their knee and accomplish the goal of getting all the way back to zero. And as they get more comfortable, what you're gonna find is if they're over their left side, as they're out, their right leg and right hip will almost try to step back around to zero wide and then they'll get the idea of trying to set that hip ahead. So, not making the ultimate goal getting back to zero, keeping the goal to be wide and level and have them get comfortable with that. Go ahead. Okay, so, that is terrible lighting on the right, I apologize. But, uh, so the step to 90. Mason here's got a band that he's got and he's, we're working on keeping his arms long, keeping that T position. So the band, if he's gonna maintain tension on the band, he's got to, he's getting some feedback there to be able to stay long. But, you can see right there he wants to pull in and just make that correction. But again, keeping the discus, whether it's with the, the dowel or with the band or with a ball, keeping it locked back, left knee over the toes, and then all we're gonna do is we're gonna push off the right foot and step to 90. And when you get to 90, or the South African position, we want your left arm, left shoulder, toe, knee, everything facing down the right sector line. So if we're driving, if the sec middle sector's here, we wanna be out towards that right sector because that will allow that feeling as that right hip steps in to create that separation. I find if they're lined up middle and they go, they're gonna over rotate and pull their upper body. So trying to exaggerate that separation and seeing down the right sector with the whole left side. I always say left, you know, I stole this from Aaron. <laughs> left linear, L, right rotational. So we want that left side to be in straight line there over it and allow the right hip to bring you around in the middle. I stole that from somebody else too. All right, see, third party theft, it's great. Um, but the left side sets the direction. McKenna's got her eyes down, I don't like that, but as you come out of the back, we're pushing over, you push off that right step ahead, your left side is setting the direction of the drive. We wanna go right there, almost like you're trying to grab for something out, and that right hip's gonna step ahead and bring you around in the middle, okay? so. Just setting that position, feeling where you want to drive from in the back, not just rotating and finding some arbitrary time to pick your left foot up. Go ahead. So, how do we maintain that posture and that separation across the circle when they've got two feet off the ground and their instincts are going to tell them to pull their left shoulder and pull their head and rotate into the finish? So, that same step to 90, driving to a stand throw. The wheel, I'm not a big fan of the wheel. Once they get the idea of keeping their moving through the middle of the throw, I like to get away from the wheel. I just think it's an, it's a personal thing. I think it's an awkward drill. I think it's tough to mimic that. 
and get them to relate to the full throw. But if you've got a young thrower and you're trying to get them to understand the right side moving through the throw and getting their left down, it's valuable. But as soon as they get that concept, I like to move on to the back of the circle as soon as I can because I don't want them to segment the middle of the circle. I want them to think about constant movement all the way through, not stopping in the middle and thinking, oh, now I'm in the wheel, I've got to turn. I want them to think about constant movement and holding that separation through the throw. Um, the step to a stand, it's basically putting focus on the lower body. Instead of just going all the way through the throw, it's getting them active with their lower body where it's almost like a step, step. They're just stepping here and coming around. It's, it's slow, full, but I call it a step to a stand so it puts the focus on the lower body. And the full to a stand, just stopping, checking the position you've landed in and being able to make the corrections that got you there. So, I, for this drill, we've got two of my collegiate guys that out in the 75 degree January heat in Tucson, but, but uh, again, setting that up in the back with that left, can you go here now and reset to just hold the start position there? Right, yeah, so right in the back, setting that left side, everything going right down that right sector line, thinking about holding that position over the left and allowing the right hip to come under that left side to the middle. And again, just keep the left side linear. Hold that direction. Try to fight the urge to want to pull yourself around with the upper body and get your shoulders back ahead of your hips. As they get into that position with the knees over the toes, same thing. We want to think about a shin angle down, sprinting off that left, not pushing straight up and jumping out of the back. Feel that left push down so there's momentum going to the middle with the left side or down the right. And the right side will turn under and catch and be able to have that momentum through the middle. Um, right side, hip leads to the middle around there, get that set up so they're in this position as much as possible, we'll get that separation with the right side of the head. Again, right foot is stepping, getting to the middle, not wanting to turn the whole body to the middle. And as they catch the stand throw as much as possible, we want that left arm back, discus or ball, whatever, locked back, we're trying to keep that left arm long and back, not open. So as that left foot comes through, trying to catch as much separation as we can, not having to pull back across their body. Go ahead. So here's the, the wheel drill. So what I use it for, and I wouldn't say to establish separation because we're already setting it up in a separated position, but it's being able to be aggressive and stepping through with the hips and the lower body and being able to be confident enough to get that left foot down without wanting to pull their shoulders in. So I'll have them load the left leg just a little bit to start so they're not feeling like they have no legs to use. So as they're in that position, just load the left leg a little bit so they can feel some push, feel some momentum with the lower body. So they're not standing straight up and using their upper body to, to get momentum into it. And with this drill, I want them to think about turning the right foot, the right knee, but the cue I like to give is to snap your hips through. So as they're here, I don't want them just turning their right and their left hanging. I want them to think about separating their hips from their upper body and snapping through. So thinking as the whole, the, the upper, or excuse me, the lower body as one part. So as they're stepping through is snap the hips ahead. So we're opening the hips up and they're both working together. So as that left foot comes through, and the right turns, they're moving together and they're setting a stretch with your hips, not just turning your right side all the way through. So pepper grinder, however you want to think about it, but just really snapping the hips through the throw, stepping through, staying over the right side. And again, catching that left side long as the hips snap through, so you're creating more separation. All the while, so the reason I use the med ball here, it takes away your arms, ability to correct for bad posture. If you've got a med ball on their chest, they really have to focus on, one, the lower body being really active, but they can't balance themselves 
out of a bad position with their arms. So you put that med ball centered right in their chest. And if they're having trouble with the posture, it almost corrects itself with the medicine ball. I like using, in the discus, I prefer using a throwing ball when you're working the wheel because when, you're, when they're trying to get in that position, they're locking the discus back, all of a sudden they're getting tight and they're holding it up and everything gets really tight. If you've got a throwing ball, they can really feel the start of that position and they're not trying to compensate for anything and their right arm's not getting tight. They can just stay back and feel that. TJ, what angle do you want the left foot to land at when they finish that wheel? Is it a little bit open? Is it close? Is it how you like want the, to see the, the, the actual foot? Right. So, in theory, I would like their left foot to land open, but even like parallel with their right foot. In, just so, because it, if it's turned back, if that heel's kicked up, in the, I don't know if you're making, <laughs> if the heel's kicked up when they hit the middle here, that's all the more time that they can shift over their left side before their left leg gets strong enough to hold it, okay? If they can, I want them to land here for two reasons. If that foot's open, they're creating more of a stretch across their hips. You got tension across their hips, but that's all they have to do to engage that left leg and start accelerating right. If they're here, one, their hips and shoulders are more even. And in a race, everybody knows their shoulders are gonna win. But if they're here, I've got a stretch across my hips, I've set a better position, all I have to do is drop the heel there, and then they can just turn all the way through. So in, I, in a perfect world, we want to be there. In reality, it's going to be probably somewhere there. But the, the shorter of a distance we can have to get that heel to the ground and just create more of a stretch across the hips. Got to be pre haircut. All right, go ahead. Okay, with the stand throw, I will work on this quite a bit. I have my moments where I think, okay, the further our stand throw gets, if all we have to do is add a little bit to it, but I like working the stand throw quite a bit just so they understand how to apply the force with the lower body and how to be patient to let the, the long right arm come around, not just get in a rush and want to rip through it. So go ahead. So again, super simple. Taking the arms out of the equation where they can feel either fake separation or trying to hide bad posture. So if you put the hands on the hips here, one, they're getting great feedback for how active their lower body is and they can feel the hips turning ahead, but they're also having to correct the posture and find where their weight balance needs to be over their feet because they can't compensate for that with where their arms are. You can see her smirking because the first couple she felt that she was shifted over her left side and it doesn't get perfect, but she starts to feel the hips turn ahead and setting the lower body a little bit ahead of her. And again, she's got her chest up, she's starting to feel just a little bit of a delay, but you're putting the emphasis on the lower body and hips. No, that's a great question. So the, the two times that I'll try to, like anytime I'm gonna emphasize anything with the head, like from a, like a point to what we wanna do, is in the back of the circle, just trying to set that direction. But when they're in the stand throw, trying to stay right over the center of the chest and keep it neutral, okay? Everybody's gonna to wanna to, you know, feel that stretch across the chest and pull their head in a little bit, but just keeping it back with the shoulders, keeping it neutral. If you've got somebody that's starting to pull away or they're starting to force that, that's where you want to cue it and tell them to keep their eyes back. But if everything starts shifting and they start kind of rushing ahead, that's where I'll take away the arms or, or go to a medicine ball because, they do, again, they don't have the arms to counterbalance it. So if they're here with a medicine ball and they're pulling off, they're going to get some really quick feedback of where they're at. So just trying to force them Almost, you know, self-preservation is a great technical skill to have, and I think everybody's got it pretty well. So if they're pulling the head off, I'll try to take away 
the arms because then they're going to be able to feel a stretch even if they're in a terrible position here they're going to feel a stretch down the chest so if you take that away and they've got to turn with their body if you've got a medicine ball or you've got something that's taking away their ability to use their arms even though the hands on the hips if they're pulling away they're going to feel that immediately because they don't have the ability to feel some kind of stretch or compensate with the arm so i'll cue it in the back and if i need to you know if they're looking down or they're you know, tell them, give them some kind of focal point in the front of the circle, but just trying to tell, teach them almost subconsciously by taking away the arms that their head will start to center and they'll start to, you know, keep it right on top of their shoulders. Go ahead. So, what is that, Austin Powers who throws a shoe? Um, but any, again, whether it's the, you know, the, the balls that have the handle on them, a throwing ball, a shoe, not releasing the implement gives a lot of feedback. And it, because you're gonna feel, oh, my arm went up or I pulled off. We wanna feel that posture. We wanna be able to come all the way through, feel the feet plugged in, feel that long, I'm a lefty by the way, sorry if I'm trying to throw people off by saying right leg. But, now this is a shot putter who had a disaster of a knee injury who didn't touch the discus for two years so he's a little cautious with it but and that is a collegiate discus thrower throwing his like holding on to a shoe but again you're taking you're taking the release away where they can just follow through on it and they're going to see oh my, you know they're not letting go they're going to feel if they're releasing down if they're shifting their weight go ahead and go with Jay so here See that left, he's getting way too out over his left side, so they can feel that. If, they, if he'd released the discus, he would have come out through that and not felt that fall away with the left side. So this is really going to reinforce the posture of the throw. And because you're not holding a discus, they can relax the arm and they can feel that stretch early. They can feel that tension and where they're at and get a lot of feedback. And like I say, it allows them to relax a little bit. And you're taking away that moment when it leaves their hands and they forget everything what they did in the circle because it's going to land somewhere. So with this ball here, I think that's a, the heaviest I would go with the guys because I don't want it to be heavy where they're dragging it. I want them to be able to stay relaxed and feel some, some feedback. I think with the guys, the heaviest I would go is probably a 2K. And depending on the strength levels, and same with the ladies, is trying to find a 1K, even if it's an 800 gram ball where they can relax. But even a shoe, it's long enough where they can feel a little bit more extension out. And you can see as a coach, a lot easier where their weight is shifting, where their posture is at, where their shoulders are going. Okay, go ahead. All right, so, same thing. Throwing ball, starting from a static position. So I've got, a uh, sophomore in college, and I've got an eighth grader. And just what it allows it again, it allows for power and feel, with, and you're more relaxed. You're not trying to compensate with holding a discus. Go ahead and play that a couple times. So we got this out of her system by the time we got into season last year, looking at the ground, and she started to pull through a lot more level. But again, it gives that feedback. If am I feeling snap? Am I staying long? How's my posture? It's just easier to cue that. And you're starting from a static position. So they're not having the benefit of winding up and cheating their way into it. They're back and they're holding that position and they've got to learn patience. It's gonna help with specific strength a little bit, but it's just, again, it's just gonna allow them to feel that long pull, that long right side through the stand throw. Um, And if you're limited by weather, if you're limited by, I have 9,000 throwers and two hours to coach him, a rubber ball into a net or a wall, you can get a lot of high quality reps in early in the year if you needed to do so. I didn't have that problem in Tucson, but you know, Eastern Washington and Northern Idaho, I find a lot more my throws into the net. Um, so, block drill. Uh, so, I'm very blessed. This is a high school sophomore. He's 6'4". His twin sister is 6'2". Um, and they came walking in one day with their mom and said, oh, we kind of like to throw. I said, come on in. 
Um, and this young lady here is a 5'11 sophomore who was a volleyball player. Her sister was a state champ high jumper, and she goes, well, I don't want to jump. I want to try throwing. It's like, come on. But um, again, adding, go ahead and play both a little bit. So you're, again, we're working on that posture and the angle of the throw, adding that overhead press. So they're still having to stick it and keep that angle. You're going to be able to see this. You're going to be able to see this. We want everything on axis, full extension up. And if they're wobbling, that tells you that they've got to correct something from the ground up. And these are not perfect by any means. But we started day one with him. It took about five minutes for him to come around. But then you start to learn that, oh, I can extend. If I extend my left, I don't shift. It, again, it almost fixes itself to feel that left leg extend and turn on axis, not wanting to shift forward. So everything's right above the head. Um, and, you know, you'll be able to see if they shift over the left. You'll be able to see if they're leading with their upper body. It just, again, it's just working on posture and feeling pressure into the ground. Oh. Oh. We're back. I didn't do it this time. Sorry for the ugly guy again. Um, so this is a, a band, and I think it's rated for 5 or 10 pounds of tension. It's not something that is going to have to be a big strain to use. The band or the handle is there to keep the hand in place. I don't use the band as resistance to pull. If, tomorrow we'll talk about using bands for developing strength, but for this drill, it's to be able to keep the throwing arm relaxed and not have to worry about pulling it, you just, you just keep it long and relaxed and try to think about not forcing tension on the band. But it's the same idea of doing that block drill, but now if you're throwing the discus and you're turning, you want to be able to feel that resistance of the implement keeping you back over your throwing side and turning, but also going all the way through where you're putting pressure into the ground over your block light. So you've got the band holding you back maintaining your posture, you've got to turn your lower body all the way through so you're feeling pressure down on that left leg if you're a right-handed thrower, not just shifting forward. So try that again a few more times. So setting that line with the front side and holding that and turning behind it, a lot of kids will think, oh, I'm not going to get over the left side, so they're going to want to shift and rush their shoulders. If they can just keep that left side down and keep turning, keep turning, keep turning all the way through, then they're gonna feel that ground pressure. And that band just gives a little bit of resistance where if they get here, it's gonna call them out. If they rush their left side, it's gonna call them out. So it's just being able to turn all the way through patiently. And as a below average, at best, mediocre discus thrower in college, you know, if I do this long enough, I can make it look halfway decent. But again, just posture, separation, ground contact working with that context. Okay. All right. Big picture stuff. Always, I always try to keep it big picture. I am not somebody that's going to start talking about where their left pinky toe is at a certain point in the throw. Anytime I, we're working on a position, anytime we're working on anything, keeping it in this context. How's their posture? Is it, is it level? I mean, there's going to be a little bit of angle as we come through, but even when they're in the stand throw, we don't want this. We want the angle to be down the front here. So as they turn, that angle will be the ideal release angle, not dropping their right side and trying to lift as they come around. So keeping the shoulders, I think it's my adapter. There we go. Ground contact, same thing. Can they, can they drop their heel? Are they in control of their hips? Or are they, you know, shifting their weight too much? Just, and again, depending on the height of the thrower, depending on their inseam, their strength, their age, that posture is going to change. That ground, the ability to hold that ground contact is going to shift a little bit. So keep that in mind. Um, and with all these things, does that allow them to accelerate the implement? through the throw, especially from the stand throw on. Are they in a good enough position with both feet on the ground 
with posture where they're going to get a direct effect? Or are they bent over or opened up where they have to almost reset their position and lose the ability to accelerate, lose the ability to have that tension through the throat? Go ahead. And cause and effect. If it's happening in the front of the circle, it probably happened and it started in the back. And it gave you dead horse kicking time. Anything I look at is with those not trying to have them mimic somebody in particular. It's just like, how is this thrower going to do that? This young man here is about 6'5", 340 pounds. He likes to lead with his upper body. He's top heavy. He's a big guy, but he's also got wide shoulders and long arms. So, but as a collegiate thrower, his legs were needed a little bit of strengthening early on. As he got that strength, his posture improved. But if I'm him, I'm going to want to lead with my upper body too. It's easy. I've got mass moving into the throw. So again, the idea of just keeping it simple. Put a, a sawed-off high jump crossbar over his shoulders. Step back a little bit with over cueing him. Try to get him to set it up, and then go ahead and hit play. side but level of trying to get that hip ahead and just getting him to get that left foot down through that throat so he's kind of falling back right he wanted to leave with that left side and fall back but again using the right tools can call out a lot of their problems and they're gonna feel it they're gonna almost if they're falling back here they're gonna know I gotta have to get my left foot down sooner or I'm gonna have to keep my posture more upright you can help them along with the cueing but you're giving them the feedback they're processing it, they're understanding what they need to do so they don't feel like they're falling. But this was the, I don't know why we're in there that particular day. I might have been being lazy. It doesn't look like we had monsoons either. But yeah, and just notice how he's not snapping the hips through. That right foot's lagging back, so the left foot's going to drift. So that's one thing in this throw. Keep it on the right keep on the ground with the right foot a little bit longer so he sets that tension and he gets left and then snapping the hips through to the stand. And that's been a couple years because that's when uh, he was waterboarding himself with the mask. Um, he was a big sweaty guy. I think he went through like four masks in practice. But, um, <laughs> feel free. My, my uh, QR code magic for our camp dates at Ironwood. I would say come on out to the Ironwood Thrower Center, but that's a little bit of a haul if you're going to load up the van and come on out. But if anybody's interested in the camp, um, click the link there. It's a great experience. We've drug quite a few people from your neck of the woods out to camp. And uh, Sarah or myself, if you have any questions about the camp, we've got some brochures up front if there's any more information you'd like. Um, does anybody have any questions? <clears throat> that early and that tired. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, one of my throwers is left handed and I'm right handed. Yes. How do you balance that? So I am always like, just do what we're doing, but backwards. Well, so when I, other I love my college coach with all my heart. I take a bullet for him. The first thing he told me is, I'm not going to try to screw you up. I'm going to coach you right handed, figure it out. I've had four left-handed throwers in 19 years of coaching. Uh -huh. I can demo left-handed, but I cannot cue them left-handed. So I just tend to go back to being right-handed. I can show them, oh yeah, yeah, so get that left foot down, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm dropping my right foot, but I'm showing them left-handed. It just gets really messy. Like, they love the fact that I'm left-handed, but I think when I try to think left-handed, I've been just conditioned in my brain to coach right-handed. but. However they can process it. If it's just, you know, flip what I'm telling you, or I, I've gone away from left, right, and I've gone to front, back, or sweep, drive, you know, just trying to, like, what the leg is trying to do. Because if I start saying left, right, and the kid starts smirking at me, I know I've, I've said the wrong leg and I've screwed it up. And they'll just start kind of smirking at me, like, are you sure? I've got a sophomore right now, she's a lefty, and she loves the fact that I'm left-handed. But when she gets the, the judging smirk on her face, I'm like, oh, I'm cueing her right-handed. But, you know, it's, she, she picks up on it. So with her, I've gone to, you know, block, 
leg turn or drive, sweep, whatever. But every so often, you know, I'll get it right and I'll actually cue left handed and demo left handed. So it's whatever they're comfortable with. I three lefties last year. Nice. See, I was dropped on my head as a kid. That's why my mom says I'm left handed. So, I mean. <laughs> it seems like left handed people are much better at turning things around in their head. I mean, we've had, you have we to have had to our whole life. Much better than right handed people are demonstrating left handed. Yeah. We have to deal with having smudges on our hand when we're writing things in school, and we've got to deal with Rose coaches that just want to tell us to do it right handed. And that's okay. Like, I was okay with that. I, that. I just did it. And like I said, drilling and cueing collegiate throwers right handed, that's just that's what I had to do. I will often have my athletes stand in front of me, so I'm doing the drill right handed, but they're in my mirror. Right? So if I'm, if I'm doing the stand throw and I'm trying to get my left hand in badly, I'm like, yeah. okay, put your foot right here, and so that's their left foot. So we can and then I tell them, now put this one here, I want it to be toed in step, or whatever it might be. So then he sees what I'm doing, but I'm still doing it what's comfortable to me, rather than like, okay, so now come this way and turn this way and trying to and be yeah. athletic when I'm not left-handed, yeah. right? See, I'm unathletic and left-handed, so see, that's the problem I have. <laughs> But how, and I, and I use that too. Like I'll just say, all right, I'm going to mirror you. If it's a like, if it's a right-handed kid and it's a portion of the throw that I'm not comfortable with demonstrating at a quality level, I'll do it left-handed. Because even left-handed for me is probably not the best demo, but it's my best shot to look like I know what I'm doing. You're very good at demoing it right-handed. Though. Well, I've noticed that before, but yeah, I, that, can't, I can't do it left-handed. I start. I'll, I'll admit, listen, I can't do it your way, but I'm gonna, I'll explain it this way, and then I try to. Switch, you know, when I want to say left, I'll say right, it's hard. And it becomes kind of fun. I mean, there are frustrating times with the athletes, but it becomes kind of fun where they're, they're, they're laughing at your pain, trying to figure out how to coach them. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, just either mirroring them or however. Yeah. Did you share your cues for the, for the right foot through the transition? Yeah. So, as they're coming out of the back, and they've already, even if it's off of a full throw, right? I want them to create as wide of a sweep as possible, but I want them to think, uh, one, the right hip, right knee brings them around to the middle in a long path. So I don't, the hard part with that step to 90 or any South African girls, they're gonna wanna take a straight line to the middle and they're gonna be right there. And it's not gonna help that. So with that step to 90 drill, that's why I want them to set that right hip a little bit further out so they're, uh, they have the ability to bring it around. As they get, now if they're a taller thrower and they're a better athlete, I'm gonna cue, you know, get, just get the right foot down to the middle and then it's gonna give them that ground contact sooner to turn on. If they're a shorter thrower or if they're a bigger thrower that hasn't grown into their body or they're a little bit weaker, as they're coming around to the middle, I'll just get that hip up lift the hip just a little bit to the middle so it's going to create a little bit more ability for them to turn on it so they're they're not just going to be stuck flat footed on the right i want to have the heel up just a little bit a little bit of a pre-turn to the middle so they're not landing here or turn back around themselves but getting into that wheel position with the heel up just a little bit pre-turn but if they're a taller athlete They've already, you know, they're creating a wide path. It's just trying to get that right foot to the ground so they can turn on it sooner. But if they're shorter or they have a little bit of trouble landing really heavy on their right foot with good posture, I'll tell them to get that hip up just a little bit to cheat that right side turning through the throat. Yeah, our problem is they, they, they stomp. Oh yeah. That, that foot and the heel comes down and then they're coming over like a cartwheel. Yeah, and, and a lot of times with that stomping down, some of that's not necessarily a right leg cue, it's they're here and all their body weight's out over it. So that's where I would eat, like go, like just, you know, convenience, laziness, whatever. Go to the med ball where, oh, they're gonna feel that and they're gonna come crashing down because they don't have the arms to be able to fix it. Next, and after, in theory, <laughs> after a few reps, I would hope to see that they're learning to keep their chest up in so, but and sometimes it is, they're just wanting to stomp down with that right foot. Um, you know, or worse yet, we have a kid that shows up without throw shoes. Oh yeah. And then and they got the, the big old wedge, you know, runner's trainers. They're, they're never gonna make that turn. Well, no, and that's, that's something that we, you know, we're very fortunate when you walk into the center, it looks like a bowling alley. 
either alums that have gone on and have left their throwing shoes, they've grown out of them. Uh, Sarah and I have found that, that I can say it now because we've already got it. But the TC Running Company, right? They just merged with another company. I'm looking online on my phone at the center the other day. They had rotationals for 1995. They had some SDs too. And they had SDs. Now, they were in the box brand new, but they were from 2010, 2012. So I went in and bought about 12 pairs. I texted her. So, you know, finding those, now that's a different different subject, but I would, but they've still got some pretty good deals. I'm not getting a kickback. What's the, what's the website? TC Running, it's the table it's right the table outside this door. <laughs> yeah, Twin Cities Running Company. Yeah, we, we had to go to Minnesota to get good deals. But, um, but with that, when they've got those shoes, that's, that's tough to tell them to turn their right if they're out, whether mom and dad can't afford a pair of throwing shoes or the kid just doesn't want to, or they're, we use this, you know, they're out because there are significant others on the team and they just wanted to stand around and, and you know, not invest the money. With those situations, it's almost that's where you've got to get creative as a coach is how can I maybe cheat that a little bit or set up a better position where they can turn through when they're wearing running shoes or their basketball shoes or, or whatever you can. or put more emphasis on the hips instead of turning the right foot. Think about the knee and the hip, just so they're using bigger movers on their body to turn, where they don't have the ability just to flick their heel and have it turn all the way through. And that's, again, just kind of cheating that a little bit. I have a six foot one girl with long levers. If I was still coaching at Arizona, I'd be getting name and number right now. But go ahead, yeah. <laughs> Two years ago, she'll go home at night, her hips are killing her, she blocks. Uh -huh. Talk about after the right foot strikes and they rotate to get that left foot back so it's not in the bucket and it's not blocked. So Is there drills that? There, I mean, you can do the wheel drill, you can do the step throughs, but it's all, again, it's out of the back. Are they, are they starting to over rotate out of the back where that left hip wants to come around there? It's, to me, that's trying to really reinforce that left side that left side out of the back loaded, set it linear. So as they come around, that left side's already coming with them and they're just putting it down. They're not, they're not here over rotating, leaving their left side behind them where they have to swing it around. That's an easy thing for she knows when she blocks. Oh, she looked at me, she's like, I blocked. I'm like, yeah, you blocked. Yeah. It's just repetitive. But it's just setting, I think it's just setting it up so it's easier for her to do that. Where it's not such, and I, I've never seen any video, I'm just making a generalization here, but just based on my experience with a lot of these kids, is they want to get here, and instead of thinking about stepping through yep. and getting it down, they're trying to swing through the home run, and all the while they're missing that position. But it's just keeping that left in their minds as a straight line. It won't be a straight line, but they've got to think about left, left, here. And if they're doing that right, they're going to rotate through, it's going to open up. Now, there's the Another drill or a concept is I'll tell them when to put the left foot down, not where. You know, it's don't waste time trying to think, oh, I've got to get into the front of the circle and they're getting here. It's like, no, now. I want, especially when we're throwing on the plywood, when to get the left foot down. Don't be preoccupied with, well, it's got to get over there. Well, if you're not set up to get it there, you still got to get it down. So thinking more of a rhythm and getting it down instead of trying to extend and step through. But yeah, just that kind of feedback. And it'll start off, they'll probably end up blocked off, but they'll find that, and as you go back to the throw, if they go back to their tendencies a little bit, they'll open up just a little bit and maybe find that comfort and then be able to get that left sooner and, and be able to turn through with the right side. Yeah. I just want to bring, I do 99% of what you've done for years, but if you could put the picture of the wheel again. Yeah. I have, I do it with the weight differently. We work on the turn, but I make them stand out of the circle with the back foot. So they don't have, so that right foot should be in the back out of the circle. Mm -hmm. And then we continue the wheel. And the reason I do that is because then they can't rotate sideways. Mm -hmm. They have to stay perpendicular yeah. and learning it from that angle. And that's been very, very successful for me be able to do that before you change the feet to that. Yeah, and, and, the, and that's a great point. The, the biggest thing that I learned is when I was a young coach, I was the best armchair quarterback in the face of the earth. Oh, if that kid would just do this, and if that kid would just do that. And then as I started going to these presentations, laying all this out, 
when you're back with your circle, you've got to take the concepts, but you've got to find things that relate to you as a coach. Like, like you're saying, like you found a way that you're comfortable with that you can explain to your athletes and they can get it sooner. It doesn't have to be cookie cutter and it, it's not right or wrong. If you're telling your athletes to, you know, cross their left eye and, you know, touch their nose with their tongue and that's making them throw farther, well, that's what's making them throw farther, however you have to cue it. But being able to say, wow, they're, I don't like this. Well, what's the what's the cause? You know, thinking cause effect, right? If you see them wanting to shift their weight or rush into it, making those adjustments. But as long as you're operating under, you know, those basic concepts and just being able to make it your own. I can lay out this and say, well, this is what I do, but you're not watching through my eyes and hearing with my ears. And you can say, all oh, these are great ideas, but you've got to go back and maybe modify that or customize it more, whether it's for your group, your facility, your athletes, your comfort level, like stuff like that. That's that's good, and that's, I'm glad we're all in the room and we can share some ideas, go ahead. Coach, what cue, cue words do you use to find balance on that block drill, you know, when, when we finish up here? What, what do you coach through that to find that balance? The, the two biggest things that I use is to tell them to be active with their left leg early, because a lot of times they're gonna wanna shift onto their left before they extend it, to get feedback into it. So the biggest thing that I have trouble with in cueing them is getting them to understand that as the right, they're thinking whole part with the hips, right? It's not right, left. It's everything turning at the same time. And, and getting them to understand that, because especially when you take the hands out of it, they're wanting to feel that left leg and then react. Well, if their weight's over their left side and they extend it, the right foot's coming off the ground and their chest is leaning forward. So the biggest thing I do is just keep that weight back on the right side, keep a bent right leg. I don't want them to push up and extend on their right leg. When your right leg extends, your hip stops turning and it slows down. If it stays bent, it just takes a little bit longer than they're comfortable with to feel that pressure down, but just keep that right leg bent and keep the hips turning. So as my right turns, my left drops. They're working together, it's not one, two, it's there. And as I'm pointing at my hips doing this drill, I feel like able to And it fits specifically for height release. So when you're, when you implement, it's one of the three important factors, so height release. I saw that in a book somewhere, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you teach through that, though, as far as finding that balance on the height of release? So the height of release for me is just in, is two things. Locking the discus back, not letting it drop but teaching them that that left leg is where the height is gonna come from. And it's, it's patience, right? They've gotta be able to turn onto that left and then they're gonna feel lift. But the, everything's raising as they do that. They're not pulling low to high. So I want them to pull through flat and get them to learn that when, that, when they engage that left, the angle of their upper body is up. They're still pulling through flat across their chest. And teaching them that the lift of the discus is like, this it's not like this so they've got to be able to hit that angle and accelerate the discus to lift it but the height of release is trying to pull through on that orbit not trying to lift with their arms so if that left leg is set the shoulders are level they turn through then they're going to be set up at that angle but so many of them want to drop their left arm and lift their right but just the patience to turn through that enough where they're delivering the discus at the right angle. So um, regarding that uh, left, left arm or right hand. Yep, I appreciate the clarification. That's good. We get the left hand. Yeah, that block in the front, like that arm needs to stop and square up in the front. Is there like any drills or cues? Like even for myself, I'm I'm a past thrower, right? And that's like it's either like the left arm. So that's, and I think I might have skipped over that somewhere in one of these slides, I hope. The biggest cue I give for the left arm, and I think I might have stolen this from Sarah and Ross at some point, or somebody, but the biggest cue I give with the left arm is I want it long to the sector. I don't want it pulling in across the body. I want them, I want them to relax and feel they can be active with the left arm, 
not hold it in place, but I want it long to the sector before they try to do anything with it because if they're trying to block prematurely or they're trying to, they're gonna pull themselves off the throw. So I want them to think about holding that right side, doing what it's doing, let that left arm go to the sector. I've created more of a stretch across my chest. So as I pull in, it allows my hips to square up because this long arm is gonna slow down my shoulders. So the only cue I'm really giving now, kid to kid, you're gonna to have to talk about where the arm's going, but as long as it's level and I'm getting this left arm to the sector, then as I block, I've created more stretch across my chest and because the shoulders are slower, it's given my hips time to square up to the sector. So when to block, I start that with the left leg. Like when that left leg grounds, that's the start of the block, but I want that arm stretched and I don't want them thinking being afraid to use their left arm when they're just tucking it back against their chest. I want like just keep it long to the sector. So you can break that down with a ball throw. Just have them get here, turn the lower body, there, all the way through, legs engaged, discus is back, and they've created that stretch. Now they can pull that arm in and turn all the way through. That's like with those ball throws, it allows you to isolate those positions and, and stay relaxed. But just keeping that, that block arm long to the sector. The back of the ring, your right foot, if you use cue athletes to just naturally pick it up, or do you actually use it to push? I cue athletes to leave their right foot on the ground as long as possible. And just let it come up naturally. Because you for two reasons, right? The little bit of push, but the longer it's on the ground, if I can stay level, I'm creating more stretch across my hips and down my right leg. So think about pulling a rubber band. The longer I keep that on there, when that right foot picks up, it's gonna have more tension. So as I get a little bit of a push or a little bit of extension with it, it's gonna whip around and catch up with me. So I think there was something online the other day they were talking about Sandra Perkovich, how long she stays on her right in the back but she's out here level over her left side. She's not, but also that's a great cue too. If they're on their right foot, they're gonna have a heck of a time rushing their upper body into the throw. And if they do, they're gonna get a lot more feedback because that right side's still anchored into the ground. When you talk about the knees and how you create the two, the two closing, you know, how you close the knees twice, talk about how you Talk to your athletes about that. In the wheel? Through the wheel and then into the stand. Through the throw. Yeah. So the two times that I'm going to talk about getting them together or working them through is, yeah, through the wheel is, if it's, and again, it goes back to that entry. If that left is set up linear, I'm there, that left is going to come through on its own. But yeah, stepping, stepping straight through, not trying to swing the left foot through. And as you get into the stand, as it steps through, then almost as the hips are moving together, they're almost gonna feel like that left knee is sucking back. That left hip is pushing them back in the circle and that right knee is gonna close and, and, and turn all the way through. So you're getting the old double pivot, like your hips are moving twice as fast. So you're not just holding your left and shifting over it. As those hips snap down, that left hip's gonna feel like it's pushing back as the right hip goes forward. And so your hips are moving twice as fast and you're going to get a stronger block. And, and if that hip's pushing them back in the circle, the shot, disc, doesn't matter. They can just put more energy to that right side and not have to feel they have to back off right. because they're going to fall out the front of the circle. That force is going up and they can keep turning all the way through it. When, when Valerie comes out of the back, it looks like she's driving her left, either inside or right. Uh-huh. You know, to, to, create that, to create that slam, uh -huh. you know, it's kind of... We used to call it the bow and nose drill, right? You know, to, to slam that in there on the balance. And um, it, it, it really it really closes the door quickly out of the back and makes the second squeeze a lot easier. Yep. And that, to me, the idea of really, you know, sitting or getting over that, that's an advanced, that's somebody who's got to have the, the wherewithal, one, but also the strength and the experience to do that. If you're getting a freshman, sophomore, junior high school kid, what I see at least is when, when you try to think about doing that, they're gonna roll over to the side of their foot, and what's gonna happen is they're gonna 
have to jump across their left foot because they're not actively turning. But if you get an advanced thrower that can understand how to be dynamic and load over that left, if they've got the athleticism and the experience to do that, I think that's, that's something that can be valuable in it. Again, just setting a better stretch out of the back. What are your thoughts on the finish between uh, non-reverse and reverse? Non-reverse? And, and, and I, I get to the point where I tell them the reverse should be natural. Like, I never put in reverse anything into a workout. If they're getting through the non well, at some point, they're, again, self-preservation cue, <laughs> they're gonna have to just pick the right foot up and step through. And especially in the discus. They're gonna use that reverse as a way like, whoa, my right foot's flat on the ground and my hips are facing that way, so the only way I'm gonna get my hips that way is I'm gonna jump up off the ground. And that goes back to my analogy, you're unplugging all your power. The second you have less than two feet on the ground, you're, you're maintaining, you're slowing down. And if you're coming to the, the, the end of that throw and reversing early, like if you're telling a kid to consciously reverse, to me, I, I non, 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 non. And if they get more comfortable and that non gets there, that non gets here, that non gets there, all of a sudden, just there's gonna be a little step through on the finish. And you're like, and then all of a sudden they look back, whoa, I reversed. If you can get one, and if you're in a slick, crappy circle in March, and you, they've fouled their first two throws, and they, they've got to know, I'm going to smack a non-reverse right out the you know, then that just breeds that confidence where they know they can non-reverse far enough to allow them. Now, if they're talented enough, they're dynamic enough, they're not just jumping at the finish, then let them do it. But I, I in the discus at the high school level, I'm, not, I, I'm going to avoid at all costs coaching an intentional reverse. All right. Awesome. A couple of announcements before uh, we head out. Our, uh, Sarah is our next speaker at 1030. Um, Rick is uh, wanting to do a demonstration of some uh, lasers. So if anybody is interested in a laser system for meets, um, he's going to do that right now after I'm done in between speakers from now until 10.30, so please uh, stick around for that if you'd like. And as always, we, plan, we run the gamut of throws coaches in the room. Some coaches probably in the room, first-year coaches have never thrown before, never coached it before, all the way to 25-year vets like me, gray in the hair, gray in the beard, uh, have been around for a long time. But man, I, I want to set up a learning environment. So if you have questions for any of our our speakers, Jill is here, Sarah is here. Yeah, DJ call is here. Do, yeah. yeah, come on up during this time that everybody is, is moving around and, and looking at vendor stuff. Please ask questions. We have other coaches in the room who, who are able to help you out also. So please don't think that any question is dumb. Uh, we're here to learn. Uh, I love the questions at the end of this and, and that atmosphere of, of uh, being able to ask questions and not be nervous about it is, is very, very key to that. So please do that. Please take advantage of these kinds of knowledge because we have spectacular speakers this year. I don't know if you look at the bios, but uh, the number of Olympic trials and American records and coaching athletes that are, that are working at the, the world-class level. And, but these guys are able to bring it to us and explain it to us in, in a way that we can relate it to high school kids is just fantastic. Not everybody can do that. So I'm very happy to have this group here uh, to be able to call them friends. It's a lot of fun to, to be able to bounce, bounce stuff off of them. So, Rick is going to take over here uh, for a second for the uh, uh, laser stuff. If you have other questions for uh, Coach TJ, he did a fantastic job. He'll be back again tomorrow with some more information. Let's give him a round of applause. Thanks, guys. Good morning, folks. Hi. Hi. You guys know me as your guy who does the laser measuring. When I try to set out a new laser system that's low cost, and it will really speed up the race. 